In recent years, we've grown accustomed to seeing Ed Sullivan's familiar face grace our Sunday night television screens. With his show, he brought over 10,000 performers into American homes, solidifying his status as one of Hollywood's most prominent figures. Yet behind the glitz and glamour lies a tale of personal struggle and hidden turmoil. Few are privy to the details of Sullivan's private life, including his battles with illness, long-standing conflicts, and the intricacies of his marriage. Today, his daughter has chosen to unveil the truth. Join us as we delve into the tragic story of Ed Sullivan's life. This is exactly what Ed Sullivan's daughter said. He was more than just a television host. He was a force to be reckoned with, fueled by a combustible mix of an Irish temper, thin skin, and an insatiable appetite for confrontation. Described by biographer Gerald Naxman as someone who could hold a grudge for a long time. Sullivan's volatile nature often led to fiery conflicts that became legendary in the entertainment industry. Sullivan's propensity for taking offense at the slightest provocation was matched only by his willingness to engage in verbal battles that could escalate at a moment's notice. As he himself admitted to Nachman, I'm a pop-off. I flare up, then I go around apologizing. This pattern of behavior stemmed from his deep-rooted passion for combat, a trait nurtured by his lifelong fascination with boxing. Throughout his career, Sullivan found himself embroiled in numerous feuds with some of the biggest names in show business. Bo Diddley, Buddy Holly, Jackie Mason, and Jim Morrison were among those who found themselves at odds with the formidable host. However, one of Sullivan's most infamous clashes occurred on November 20th, 1955, when African-American rock and roll sensation Bo Diddley appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. The controversy erupted when Diddley, scheduled to perform Tennessee Ernie Ford's hit 16 Tons, unexpectedly deviated from the agreed-upon song choice and opted to perform his own hit, Diddley Daddy, instead. This impromptu decision incensed Sullivan, who had meticulously orchestrated the show's lineup and expected performers to adhere to his instructions. As the show went on air, tensions reached a boiling point backstage at CBS Studios 57. Sullivan's frustration was palpable as he confronted Diddley over his refusal to comply with the agreed-upon song selection. Witnesses described a heated exchange between the two, with Sullivan vehemently urging Diddley to reconsider his choice. Despite Sullivan's attempts to persuade him otherwise, Diddley remained steadfast in his decision, prompting Sieb's executive to convene an emergency meeting to salvage the broadcast. With the show's timing thrown into disarray by Diddley's unexpected deviation, producers scrambled to adjust the schedule on the fly. In the aftermath of the incident, Sullivan's feud with Diddley only served to underscore his reputation as a formidable adversary not to be trifled with. While the confrontation may have been resolved on that fateful night, the animosity between they two lingered, a testament to Sullivan's enduring ability to hold a grudge. Buddy Holly and the Cricket's relationship with Ed Sullivan was marked by tension and confrontation showcasing Sullivan's authoritative demeanor and Holly's defense in the face of it. The events surrounding their second appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show in January 1958 serve as a testament to the clash of wills between the iconic host and the burgeoning rock and roll star. Their band's initial appearance in 1957 had garnered an enthusiastic response from Sullivan's audience, but their return in 1958 was fraught with controversy. Sullivan, known for his meticulous control over the content of his show, took issue with the lyrics of the cricket's chosen song, Oh Boy, deeming them too suggestive for his conservative tastes. Unyielding in his stance, Sullivan demanded that Holly substitute another song, disregarding the singer's prior commitments and personal preferences. Holly, however, was not one to acquiesce easily to authority. Having already promised his hometown friends in Texas that he would be performing Oh Boy, he refused to comply with Sullivan's directive, much to the host's chagrin. 
The exchange between the two escalated as Sullivan, unaccustomed to having his commands challenged, reiterated his orders with increasing frustration, only to be met with Holly's steadfast refusal to back down. The tension between Sullivan and Holly reached its peak during rehearsals. Where the band's perceived lack of enthusiasm drew a pointed remark from Sullivan himself. Sensing Holly's lingering annoyance, Sullivan retaliated by diminishing the band's stage presence, cutting their performance from two numbers to just one. Moreover, he deliberately sabotaged the sound, quality of Holly's guitar amplifier, ensuring that his instrument remained barely audible except during his solo. Despite Sullivan's attempts to undermine their performance, the crickets captivated the audience with their electrifying energy and musical talent. Their reception was so overwhelming that Sullivan found himself compelled to extend another invitation to the band, only to be met with Holly's biting retort about Sullivan's financial limitations. Photographs captured during the appearance depict Holly's defiant smirk juxtaposed with Sullivan's visibly angered demeanor, encapsulating the simmering animosity between the two. In this clash of personalities, Holly emerged as a symbol of youthful rebellion, challenging Sullivan's authority and asserting his autonomy as an artist. Jackie Mason's tumultuous relationship with Ed Sullivan epitomizes the volatile nature of show business, where misunderstandings and misinterpretations can have lasting repercussions. The incident during Mason's October 1964 performance on The Ed Sullivan Show serves as a cautionary tale of how a simple miscommunication can escalate into a career-altering event. The stage was set for Mason's appearance, amidst the backdrop of a shortened show, necessitated by President Lyndon Johnson's address. As Mason took to the stage, Sullivan, stationed off-camera but visible to the comedian, discreetly signaled that he had only two minutes remaining by holding up two fingers. Unbeknownst to Sullivan, this seemingly innocuous gesture would set off a chain of events that would reverberate through Mason's career. Sullivan's signal inadvertently distracted the studio audience, who interpreted it as an indication that Mason's jokes were falling flat. Sensing the waning attention of the crowd, Mason, in a desperate attempt to regain their focus, exclaimed, I'm getting fingers here, and mimicked Sullivan's hand gesture, adding his own frantic flourish with the remark, Here's a finger for you. The ambiguity of Mason's gesture, captured only partially on videotape, left room for interpretation. While some viewers perceived it as an indecent gesture, a raised middle finger, others remained uncertain. However, Sullivan, convinced of Mason's intent, promptly banned him from future appearances on the program, citing the alleged misconduct. Mason, caught in the crossfire of misunderstanding, vehemently denied any knowledge of the meaning behind the middle finger gesture. He maintained that his hand gesture was innocuous and that he had no intention of offending anyone. Despite his protestations, the damage to Mason's reputation was done, and his exclusion from the Ed Sullivan show had far-reaching consequences for his career. In a surprising turn of events, Sullivan extended an olive branch to Mason in September 1965, orchestrating a surprise grand reunion on the show. However, the reconciliation was short-lived as Mason discovered that the supposed camaraderie between him and Sullivan was one-sided. Despite Sullivan's purported apology, Mason never received another invitation to appear on the show, leaving him disillusioned and financially strained. The fallout from the incident had a significant impact on Mason's earning potential as he recounted how his income was cut right in half following his banishment from the Ed Sullivan show. It would take over two decades for Mason to reclaim his stature in the entertainment industry, culminating in a triumphant Broadway debut in 1986. The Ed Sullivan show, a cultural institution of its time, was not without its share of clashes with rebellious rock and roll acts. From the birds to the doors and the rolling stones, the show bore witness to confrontations that underscored the generation gap and shifting cultural attitudes of the 1960s. On December 12, 1965, 
Tensions flared between the birds' David Crosby and the show's director, culminating in a shouting match that sealed the band's fate. The altercation, fueled by creative differences and perhaps the clash of egos, led to the birds being blacklisted from future appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, closing the door on a potentially lucrative platform for exposure. Similarly, the Doors found themselves at odds with Sullivan's censorship when they performed their signature song, Light My Fire, in September 1967. Sullivan deemed the lyric, Girl, We Couldn't Get Much Higher, to overt a reference to drug use and demanded that it be changed to, Girl, We Couldn't Get Much Better. The band initially acquiesced, nodding their assent, but ultimately sang the song as written, defying Sullivan's authority and sealing their own fate as persona non grata on the show. Jim Morrison's defiant response to producer Bob Precht's admonition encapsulated the spirit of rebellion that characterized the era. Hey man, we just did the Ed Sullivan show. The Doors' defiance, coupled with their unapologetic performance, effectively severed their ties with Sullivan's program, cementing their reputation as countercultural icons. The Rolling Stones, no strangers to controversy themselves, famously clashed with Sullivan during their fifth appearance on the show in 1967. Mick Jagger's refusal to censor the titular lyric of Let's Spend the Night Together epitomized the band's rebellious spirit. Despite Sullivan's insistence on toning down the lyrics to Let's Spend Some Time Together, Jagger defiantly called attention to the censorship, further enraging Sullivan, but solidifying the Stones' reputation as provocateurs. Despite his stature as a showman, Sullivan's forgetfulness became a recurring theme throughout his career, often leading to humorous and sometimes awkward moments on his legendary variety show. Mo Howard of the Three Stooges recalled a particularly memorable incident from their first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Sullivan, in a momentary lapse, introduced the trio as the Three Ritz Brothers, only to rectify his mistake with a quick-witted quip. Who look more like the Three Stooges to me? This humorous recovery exemplified Sullivan's ability to laugh off his own forgetfulness and endear himself to both his guests and audiences. However, not all interactions with Sullivan were as lighthearted. Joe Dorita, who joined the Three Stooges lineup in 1959, offered a less flattering assessment of Sullivan's personality, likening it to the bottom of a birdcage. This characterization suggests a more contentious relationship between Dorita and Sullivan, perhaps fueled by frustrations stemming from Sullivan's forgetfulness or other interpersonal dynamics. Even Diana Ross, who held Sullivan in high regard, couldn't overlook his tendency to forget names. Ross recounted numerous occasions when Sullivan referred to her and her fellow Supremes simply as the girls, highlighting his struggle to recall individual names amidst the whirlwind of performers gracing his stage. One of the most poignant anecdotes comes from Paul McCartney, who recalled a meeting with Sullivan in the early 1970s. Despite his global fame as one of the Beatles, Sullivan failed to recognize McCartney, displaying signs of memory loss or confusion. McCartney's attempt to jog Sullivan's memory proved futile as Sullivan nodded and smiled politely, unaware of the significance of the encounter. As time passed, Sullivan's memory lapses became more pronounced, with Joan Rivers noting in a 2012 interview with Howard Stern that Sullivan had been suffering from dementia toward the end of his life. This revelation sheds light on the toll that age and illness can take on even the most vibrant personalities, serving as a poignant reminder of Sullivan's humanity behind the glitz and glamour of his television persona. Ed Sullivan's involvement in the Cold War-era anti-communism reflects the pervasive atmosphere of suspicion and paranoia that gripped American society during the late 1940s and 1950s. Like many entertainers of his time, Sullivan found himself entangled in the web of political intrigue and ideological warfare that characterized the era. One notable incident occurred in January 1950 when tap dancer Paul Draper's scheduled appearance on Toast of the Town, later known as The Ed Sullivan Show, sparked controversy. 
Hester McCullough, an activist fervently engaged in the hunt for alleged subversives, branded Draper a Communist Party sympathizer and called for his appearance to be canceled. Despite Draper's denial of the charge, the outcry led to over a thousand angry letters and telegrams being sent to Ford Motor Company, Sullivan's lead sponsor. Under pressure from Ford, Sullivan made assurances to the company's advertising agency, Kenyon and Eckhart, promising to avoid controversial guests in the future. However, the fallout from the incident was significant, with Draper ultimately forced to relocate to Europe in order to continue his career. This episode underscored the perils of being associated with perceived political dissent during the Red Scare era. Following the Draper incident, Sullivan adopted a more cautious approach, collaborating closely with Theodore Kirkpatrick of the anti-communist counterattack newsletter. Kirkpatrick became Sullivan's go-to source for vetting potential guests' political leanings, ensuring that they met the standards of loyalty demanded by the prevailing anti-communist sentiment. In his June 21, 1950, Daily News column, Sullivan acknowledged Kirkpatrick's role, writing, Kirkpatrick has sat in my living room on several occasions and listened attentively to performers eager to secure a certification of loyalty. This statement underscores the extent to which Sullivan and other entertainers were willing to go to appease the demands of anti-communist zealots and maintain their standing in the entertainment industry. The Cold War cast a long shadow over American society, permeating even the realm of entertainment with its ideological tensions and political sensitivities. One notable instance of Cold War repercussions unfolded in May 1963, when Bob Dylan was slated to appear on The Ed Sullivan Show. Dylan, known for his outspokenness and social commentary, had chosen to perform Talkin' John Birch Paranoid Blues, a satirical song that skewered the ultra-conservative John Birch Society and its penchant for seeing communist conspiracies everywhere. During rehearsals for the show, no objections were raised by anyone, including Sullivan himself, indicating a tacit acceptance of the song's content. However, on the day of the broadcast, CBS's Standards and Practices Department intervened, rejecting the song over fears of potential defamation lawsuits. The department expressed concerns that the lyrics, which equated the John Birch Society's views with those of Adolf Hitler, could provoke legal action and tarnish the network's reputation. Faced with the ultimatum of either choosing a different song or forgoing his appearance altogether, Dylan opted for the latter, steadfast in his refusal to compromise his artistic integrity. His decision reverberated across the media landscape, generating widespread attention and sparking debates about censorship and artistic freedom. In the aftermath of the controversy, Sullivan publicly denounced the network's decision in interviews, expressing his disappointment and frustration with the censorship of Dylan's performance. Sullivan's outspoken defense of Dylan and artistic expression underscored the tension between commercial interests and creative freedom in the context of Cold War-era America. The clash between Ed Sullivan and CBS's Standards and Practices Department was not limited to musical performances or political commentary. It extended to matters of personal and professional redemption as well. One such instance occurred in 1956 when Sullivan found himself at odds with the network over his invitation to actress Ingrid Bergman to appear on his show. Bergman, a celebrated actress known for her captivating performances in films such as Casablanca and Notorious, had been living in self-imposed exile in Europe since 1950. Her scandalous love affair with director Roberto Rossellini, which led to their respective divorces, had triggered a moral outrage in conservative America, prompting Bergman to seek refuge abroad. However, in 1956, Bergman was poised to make a triumphant return to Hollywood with her starring role in Anastasia. Sullivan, recognizing the significance of her comeback and confidence in the American public's capacity for forgiveness, extended an invitation for Bergman to appear on The Ed Sullivan Show. 
He even flew to Europe to film an interview with Bergman, along with co-stars Yul Brynner and Helen Hayes, on the set of Anastasia. However, upon his return to New York, Sullivan was met with resistance from CBS's Standards and Practices Department, which adamantly opposed Bergman's appearance on the show, whether live or in pre-recorded footage. The department, wary of potential backlash and moral indignation, refused to budge on their decision, leaving Sullivan frustrated and disappointed. Despite standards and practices objections, Sullivan's prediction proved prescient. Bergman's performance in Anastasia garnered critical acclaim and earned her a second Academy Award, signaling her triumphant return to Hollywood's spotlight. Moreover, her portrayal of the titular character, coupled with her public persona of contrition and redemption, endeared her once again to audiences, who embraced her with open arms. Ed Sullivan's daughter also revealed more details about his married life. His engagement to champion swimmer Sybil Bauer was cut short by her untimely death from cancer in 1927 at the tender age of 23, leaving Sullivan bereft and grappling with profound loss at a young age. In the midst of his grief, Sullivan found solace in the company of Sylvia Weinstein, whom he met in 1926. Despite the initial blossoming of their relationship, Sylvia faced familial opposition due to Sullivan's Catholic faith. To navigate this obstacle, Sylvia initially concealed Sullivan's true identity, presenting him to her family as a Jewish man named Ed Solomon. However, her brother eventually uncovered the truth, sparking vehement objections from both families to the prospect of an interfaith marriage. Faced with familial disapproval, Sullivan and Sylvia endured a tumultuous three-year hiatus in their relationship. Yet, their love proved resilient, and they ultimately defied the odds by tying the knot in a city hall ceremony on April 28, 1930. Their union was a testament to their unwavering commitment to each other, despite the societal barriers they faced— the joy of their marriage was further compounded by the arrival of their daughter, Elizabeth, affectionately known as Betty, eight months later. Betty's birth brought newfound happiness to Sullivan and Sylvia, serving as a beacon of hope and renewal after the dark clouds of loss and adversity. Tragically, Sullivan's mother, Elizabeth, after whom Betty was named, had passed away earlier that same year. Yet, in the midst of sorrow, Betty's birth symbolized the circle of life and the enduring legacy of love that transcends generations. As Betty grew, she became an integral part of Sullivan's life and career. Her marriage to Bob Presht, a producer on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1952, further solidified the family's connection to the entertainment industry. Through Betty's union, Sullivan's personal and professional worlds intertwined, creating a legacy that would endure for generations to come. Throughout their years in New York City, the Sullivans established a comfortable and glamorous lifestyle, befitting their status as one of the city's most prominent couples. In 1944, they transitioned from their longtime residence at the Hotel Astor on Times Square to a suite of rooms at the prestigious Hotel Del Monaco. This move marked a new chapter in their lives, offering a luxurious and refined setting for both their personal and professional pursuits. Ed Sullivan, ever the consummate professional, transformed one of the hotel's suites into his personal office, where he meticulously planned and organized The Ed Sullivan Show until its cancellation in 1971. This dedicated space served as the nerve center of Sullivan's operations, where he oversaw every aspect of the iconic variety show that would captivate audiences for decades. Despite his boosy scheduli, Sullivan remained deeply connected to his family, particularly his wife, Sylvia. It was a ritual for Sullivan to call Sylvia after each program, eagerly awaiting her critique and feedback. Sylvia's insights and guidance played a crucial role in shaping the direction of the show, reflecting the couple's partnership both on and off the screen.
Beyond their professional endeavors, the Sullivans enjoyed a vibrant social life, regularly dining and socializing at New York City's most exclusive clubs and restaurants. Places like the renowned Stork Club, Danny's Hideaway, and Jimmy Kelly's became familiar haunts for the couple, where they mingled with fellow celebrities, U.S. presidents, and even received audiences with popes. Their circle of friends included luminaries from the entertainment industry, politics, and beyond, attesting to the Sullivan's status as fixtures of New York's social scene. Behind the scenes, Sylvia Sullivan played a vital role as her husband's financial advisor, offering shrewd insights and prudent management of their assets. Her untimely passing on March 16, 1973, at Mount Sinai Hospital, marked the end of an era for the Sullivan family. Her loss left a profound void in Ed Sullivan's life. Yet her legacy of unwavering support and devotion endured, shaping the fabric of their enduring love story. In early September 1974, Sullivan received a devastating diagnosis, an advanced stage of esophageal cancer. Doctors delivered the grim prognosis, offering little hope for recovery and indicating that Sullivan had only a short time left to live. Yet, in a poignant decision, Sullivan's family chose to shield him from the truth, opting to keep the severity of his condition a closely guarded secret. Sullivan, unaware of the gravity of his illness, continued to grapple with his health struggles, attributing his symptoms to complications from a long-standing battle with gastric ulcers. Despite the ominous clouds looming overhead, Sullivan faced his final days with characteristic stoicism and resolve. Tragically, on October 13, 1974, Ed Sullivan passed away at New York's Lenox Hill Hospital, surrounded by loved ones who had shared in his remarkable journey. His death marked the end of an era, leaving behind a legacy that transcended the boundaries of entertainment and etched his name into the annals of American cultural history. The news of Sullivan's passing reverberated across the nation, eliciting an outpouring of grief and tributes from fans, friends, and colleagues alike. His funeral, held at the majestic St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, drew an immense crowd of mourners, with approximately 2,000 people braving the cold, rainy day to pay their respects to the beloved icon. Following the funeral service, Sullivan was laid to rest in a crypt at the Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York, his final resting place serving as a solemn reminder of his enduring legacy. Yet even in death, Sullivan's influence and impact continued to reverberate throughout the entertainment industry and beyond. In recognition of his indelible contributions to the world of television, Ed Sullivan was posthumously honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, forever enshrining his name among the luminaries of the entertainment capital. Additionally, in 1985, Sullivan was welcomed into the Television Academy Hall of Fame, solidifying his status as a pioneering figure in the evolution of television broadcasting. What do you think about the tragedies that happened in Ed Sullivan's life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.